Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Larry Holder. I'm a professor in the computer science department. I'm also the director of the Smart Environments Research Center, which is one of the entities that is uh, sponsoring these distinguished uh, speakers, along with uh, a grant from the National Institute of Health. Uh, Dr. Cook and Dr. Schmidt-Orechkom are running. Uh, so today we have Dr. Andrew Sixsmith with us, who is a uh, professor at Simon Fraser University. Uh, he got his PhD from the University of London in 1989, and uh, it looks like for about the next, uh, I guess, two decades or so, he was essentially uh, educating and, I guess, coordinating several initiatives in the EU uh, you know, educating people, I think, about gerontology and the issues involved. Uh, and then in um, 2007 is when he came to Simon Fraser University, and uh, currently he is the uh, director of the Gerontology Research Center and also the deputy director of the Interdisciplinary Research in Mathematical and Computer Science, Computational Sciences Center. Your Max? Um, so he's been very busy there, and uh, recently, in, in last year, he became the president of the International Society for Gerontology, which has the, you know, the flagship journal for gerontology, maintains that. And then most recently, he was uh, appointed the scientific director of the AgeWell initiative, which I think he's going to talk about. It's a mouthful for the acronym there. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, Alex Mihalovic is also a director there, so they, I guess, co, co scientifically direct that initiative. We had Alex here before. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Sixman. Thank you very much. Is this recording or you can hear it? Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I've just had nice lunch and I ate cougar gold cheese. This is hooray, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm sampling the delights of, uh, of Pullman. Um, I'm going to be talking to you uh, generally about technology and aging, uh, but specifically about Age Well, uh, which is a brand new initiative that's uh, been funded by the Canadian federal government to really uh, drive innovation in the broadly the, uh, the healthcare sector for, for seniors uh, and to look at how technology can, uh, can uh, stimulate and drive innovation um, and commercialization within this, uh, within this field. Um, so I'm not particularly, in fact I know I'm not going to be talking about the the nuts and bolts of the technologies. I'm, I'll describe some of the some of the stuff, but I'm not going to get into um, much in the way of detail about sensors, algorithms, or anything like that. It's more uh, more particularly about the the idea of innovation. You know, I'm guessing everybody in this room is is probably interested in seniors and probably interested in technology. Um, and wants to see technology have an impact on the, the health, quality of life, and well-being of, of seniors. You know, that's probably the, uh, that, that's the reason I'm in this, in, the, in this area. So innovation and how we turn the research that we do in the laboratories into real-world uh, products and services is something that I'm, uh, I'm increasingly getting interested in. Okay, there we go. Uh, so, a good, a good way of starting things off is to introduce you to uh, uh, this guy, which is Jim. Okay, so uh, just to give you some background about Jim. Jim was somebody who participated in a research project that I did back in England, maybe about six, six years ago. Uh, and I did this project with uh, British Telecom, um, who are a big, uh, uh, obviously a big telecom provider in, in Europe. And they were interested in this broad field of smart homes and 
uh, and monitoring technologies and how we might be able to use sensors in, um, in the home uh, to uh, support people to live independently, to particularly keep them out of, out of hospital, um, keep them out of nursing homes, which are, which are very expensive uh, places for people to live. Has anybody stayed for any length of time in a hospital? One person, yeah. It's not the best place to spend more than a few hours, really. Yeah. So, and particularly if you're a, if, if you're a, 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 a senior, say with dementia, spending any time in a clinical environment like a hospital is an extremely debilitating experience. Um, and, I, the, and I was talking to the group this morning about institutional care as well. Moving into an institutional environment like a nursing home is also a very debilitating thing for a person as well. Um, so really we, we want to help people to live independently and live at home as far as possible. So that's you know, a, a big mission in life. And I'm guessing it's one of the mission in life of people around here, yeah? Yeah? So we're all on the same page with that, yeah? Okay. So Jim. Jim is somebody who would be probably categorized as having uh, medium level dementia, right? So if you, um, if you did a, some sort of cognitive test on, on Jim, he wouldn't score that great, okay? Um, you know, he probably wouldn't know what day it was or who the, pr who the president is or, or whatever, you know, the sort of things that you, questions you ask to, um, to evaluate somebody's uh, cognitive uh, status. But he was, he was living at home. Um, he was able to uh, live his life fairly independently despite being, you know, uh, ha you know having problems with, uh, with memory loss. Um, he, he would go around his neighborhood, he'd be able to find his way back home and he was, uh, he, you know, reasonably, he was a happy guy. He was uh, um, able to live in the place that he'd always lived. Uh, he, he got help from his sister. His sister would come in most days to uh, check on him, uh, to see everything was all right with him, did little things around the house and, uh, 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 you know, and make sure everything was, was going good with Jim. He used to go out to the local shops and buy his food and, uh, and things like that. So despite having um, you, you know, uh, a fair level of, of cognitive impairment, he was somebody who probably was, uh, w w was able to cope with that within his, within his circle. I'm sure people have come across similar sort of scenarios. Yeah? Okay, so we'll come back to Jim in a little while. So, the name of my network in Canada is called Age Well. Notably, it's not called Age Bad, okay? So, and my, I'm, I'm, I get quite angry about when I look at the history of the way that we've cared for seniors uh, within our society over uh, uh, many, many decades of of, uh, of caring uh, for people who are vulnerable. Um, so even, uh, you know, a lot of people in this sector have personal stories to tell, you know, about things that they've experienced and, um, you know, which has had an impact on them later in life. So I remember my grandfather was, uh, had dementia and uh, he ended up in this absolutely awful place. And this was quite a few years ago. Uh, things have Things have changed for the better. Uh, but he ended up in this place where, he, you know, it really was not a nice environment for him to be. There was very little around at that time in, in terms of supporting people with dementia. You were channeled into a very clinical uh, environment. You know, uh, if you've seen uh, horror stories of, of asylums, you know, on the movies and things like that, that's, get that in your head. That's what it was like, okay? Um, so it wasn't a nice experience for him, certainly wasn't a nice, nice experience for any of his family. So my mother would end up in tears whenever she'd visit him, you know, because uh, it, was just, it was just not nice at all. 
So things have improved, but I do believe that we can, we can do a lot better than we are. And the way that we deliver our services in many ways is part of the problem, you know? It's interesting when we hear over and over again about how we've got this aging population that is going to swamp the healthcare services and that the healthcare services are not going to be able to uh, afford to cope with the aging, uh, with the aging population. Have you heard this, 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 uh, this kind of um, uh, idea before? If you, if you look at this, the actual stats on the cost of healthcare, the increase in population aging is driving up, is driving up expenditure but only at a relatively small amount, okay? The big cost increase is in the, on the supply side, the cost of services, the cost of drugs, the cost of human personnel, uh, the cost of the infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, <coughs> is the thing that is driving up the costs of, um, of healthcare expenditure on, uh, on, on seniors. Uh, that's definitely, if we look at the stats in Canada, that is, that is the case. So really, what we should be doing is thinking in innovatory ways to improve the job that we do, okay? Um, in terms of the healthcare and the social services and the community support that we give to people, um, so that people can live independently with a good quality of life in the places that they like to live, okay? Rather than channeling people into expensive services that people actually don't want, okay? It's interesting that we, that all of, you know, so much expenditure goes onto something we actually don't want. We might need it, but not many people actually would put their hands up and say, I want to live in a nursing home. Not many people would put their hands up and say, I, you know, I want to go into the emergency room or, or, a, or a hospital. You know, these are essential things in our lives, but I think we need to find innovative ways to help people to stay independent. Okay, so things are not adding up. Uh, so these are stats that are taken from Canada. 5% uh, of the population that are in residential care, in nursing homes, etc., consumes 21% of the healthcare resources in British Columbia. Okay, that's a huge disproportion between the, 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 the size of the, uh, the, the user population and the actual consumption of resources. If you ask most people, most people would prefer to go on living in the communities and in the present homes as far as possible. I'm sure everybody's heard that, you know, we know, we, we, we know that, okay. Some interesting other stats though is that uh, we, we have um, a seniors advocate in the British Columbia provincial government whose job is, is to uh, moan about the way seniors are uh, treated, okay. That's her official job. Uh, so, and she's very strong uh, on, on the point that even d despite we say, uh, us saying that, well, the costs are so high uh, in, in, say, residential care, 15% um, of people in a residential care probably there because there's nothing else around, okay? Because the options in the community are, are not are just not there to, to support their needs. So the only fallback scenario for them is to move into, resident, into expensive residential care. So 15% of people in residential care, around about that, are probably uh, there because, you know, the, the, there's nothing else for that person. Uh, and indeed, there's a lack of community and preventative services. And the emergency room is often the first point of contact for people. I'll give you a story here uh, about emergency room self-admission, okay? Uh, I, did, um, I did some work with, uh, in, in this project with, with Jim uh, with people with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Um, do people know what that is? Yeah? 
So it's one of these conditions where it's ve often very, very difficult to breathe. And, uh, and often this has a significant um, effect on the, on the person and they, they have panic attacks and things like that. And that ex actually exacerbates the, uh, the, their, uh, uh, their uh, condition. Uh, one lady we interviewed in, as part of our study admitted herself into the emergency room over 20 times in one month simply because she was getting these exacerbations and she couldn't breathe, she would panic and she, would, she had very little support around her and, um, you know, uh, and she, she ended up going into the emergency room all the time. And she'd go there and then she'd come back home and it was kind of a, a very, very uh, bad situation. I don't know how long that went on for. Uh, I'm guessing not, be not very long. And also, because of the increasing numbers of seniors within the population and a relatively limited budget, the relative spending on seniors is reducing. You know, simple mathematical uh, calculation there. Uh, and I think um, I've certainly seen the stats on that in, um, in Britain. I've not, not particularly seen the stats on it elsewhere, but Clearly, it's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's a common problem. Another point is that providing support in the community is not just about healthcare. We often talk about the medical conditions that people have, you know, and we hear about chronic conditions associated with old age, uh, heart failure, COPD, diabetes. Uh, dementia, a whole range of, uh, of, of illnesses around, around that. And, you know, uh, our, our healthcare system is trying to respond to that. But in many cases, being independent at home, in your own home in the community, is m as much about things like, you know, the house that you're living in, the community services that are around, the mobility, the, you know, the public transit, etc., etc as it is the, the healthcare support. So we quite often get, um, we, we, we often see, see seniors in a, this blinkered way where we're simply focusing on their healthcare needs and forget about the other needs that, that people have. Um, uh, so if we're talking about solutions to help people stay independent, we have to keep that in, in mind because uh, there's all these other things, and if there's one thing in, that's missing, it could undermine the whole, uh, the whole house of cards, and the whole house of cards comes down. So, is this what cougar gold cheese looks like? No? <laughs> no it's Swiss cheese, and why have I put a picture of Swiss cheese uh, uh, up here? Anybody, anybody got any guesses? It's got holes, and what, are the, what do the holes signify? Gaps. Pardon? Gaps. Gaps, that's a good point, yeah. Any, what, what else might metaphors of? Okay, yeah, the gaps, the gaps in cheese, in, 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 the, uh, in, in the cheese are, uh, is quite important. Okay, we'll come on to that. So the question is, why do things go wrong? Okay, um, and particularly, why do, why, why do people become dependent? Why do they lose independence? Why is it that they change from being somebody who's able to cope relatively well? And actually, we've been chatting about this uh, uh, this morning in various things about how people are really quite good at coping, but sooner or later, something might happen that really undermines a person's ability to, uh, to remain independent. So why, why does that happen? Why do things go wrong? So we started to look at another area. Uh, it's quite often interesting to go in a completely different area to see what's happened over here. It kind of takes you out of your comfort zone, makes you stand back from the, the area that you're, uh, that, that you're involved in and, and maybe help you to think of different uh, ideas and solutions. So we looked at the aviation industry, okay, and uh, most people 
most people here don't remember the early days of aviation, okay? <laughs> I'm prob I've probably got the longest memory here. Um, in the old days, planes weren't that safe, okay? Uh, and in the early, early days of, um, you know, mass aviation, and we're talking, say, the mid-1950s onwards, so in the early days in the, um, in the 50s and the 60s and into the 70s, um, you know, there were quite a lot of crashes. And airplanes crashing was definitely not good publicity. Okay. There was no way that the aviation industry, which we all take for granted, could really have thrived without dealing very, very seriously with the problems of, uh, of safety. So they... Uh, so they decided to look at what, what are the reasons for the failures that were existing. You know, we, quite often um, aviation uh, accidents typically would be accounted for by pilot error. That was the, the, common, uh, the common there. But, uh, the, so uh, a researcher called James Reason started to, to look at this. And he really found that it's actually a very, very complex problem that the reason things fail, and maybe engineers, how many engineers are there in the room? One, one or two, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the reason why things fail are not usually just for, uh, sorry, I'm playing on the words of the, of the, na the name of the guy here, that often confuse people. Um, the reasons why things fail or go wrong are typically not just one isolated thing that goes wrong. Um, for example, there may be preconditions for unsafe acts, such as, you know, the, the aircrew is, is fatigued, you know, uh, or there are inadequate communications practices. So little mistakes can happen because the flight crew are tired. They've had, the, you know, their shifts have been too long. Um, they, they, the, the communications between the first and, uh, officer and the captain or the, um, the, the navigation officer or whatever uh, was not sufficiently um, uh, uh, agile enough to respond to, a vet, to an emergency situation. Uh, supervision also, for example, is, you know, if you, if you fly an airplane with two inexperienced pilots on a night flight in particular uh, conditions, okay, probably not the best plan. But in the old days, they really hadn't figured out that very well. Um, yeah. And organizational influences include things such as reduction in expenditure on pilot training in, in, terms of, in times of financial austerity. So, what, you know, if, if, if business is bad, what do you cut back on? Oh, well, we'll cut back on, the, <laughs> we'll come back on safety, on training, and, thing, and things like that. Um, and then we come to the, the, the kind of classical um, explanations for things going wrong, which is down to mistakes and errors are being made, or you know, the, the things that often hit the headlines when you, you have some sort of an intentional act, like the, uh, the, German, pilot, the German Wings pilot earlier this year, you know, who flew the plane into a, a mountain. Okay, that's a very, very uncommon um, situation. However, they did learn from that situation, you know? That's another aspect of this, is that there's a level of institutional learning. Think, if things go wrong, you've got to think about why it went wrong and put things in place based on, on, your, ex, on your experience. So, this is where the cheese comes in, right? Is that we've explained the wide range of problems that might occur, okay, in lead, that may increase the risk for something bad to happen. But typically, what you, the scenario is usually when multiple things coincide, then things start, things will go wrong. And it's very difficult to predict these. So you actually have to over-engineer the situation to some extent, to try and avoid the, uh, the, the holes aligning and the things going wrong. Some take-home messages from this. 
things typically go wrong when system levels factors uh, combine. Okay. There are also what might be called latent and active factors. So an active factor might be you know, somebody making a mistake you know, when they're flying the plane. But why is that mistake happening in the, in the first place? Maybe it's because the person hasn't been adequately trained to deal with a particular situation. And if there had been training in place for that person or better communication practices, they would have been better adapted to deal with the problem. And usually there's no single person or organization to blame in these scenarios. And this is really important for um, what might be called safety culture and the culture of an organization. In a dysfunctional organization, there's a lot of finger pointing. Oh, it went wrong because she did it or he did it, you know? Um, and, and really, in a, in a functional organization, one needs to be looking at saying, well, people are not necessary, you know, there's negligence, of course, but generally speaking, people don't do things because they're bad people, okay? They're trying to do a good job, often in very difficult circumstances. And things go wrong often because of the, the latent underlying factors which result in individual error. So simply to point to the individual as the culprit is not a very good way of improving your safety. Okay? So you, you blame somebody. What do you do? You fire them. You get somebody else in. Okay? Then somebody else makes the same mistake etc, etc. So the big take home message here is that if you really want to do something, you can do something because the aviation industry at one point in history was quite dysfunctional, okay? And it was affecting sales, it was, you know, um, it, if planes were, fall, you know, crashing into the sea or mountains or there was fires and things like that, that really wasn't good for business. So the aviation industry really got its act together. And last year, I've not seen this year's statistics, was the safest year ever on record in the aviation industry uh, in terms of accidents per, uh, you know, per number of trips. Okay. So what we... I'll come back to the, to the lessons around this. Uh, uh, in, in a minute. So I'm talking about age well. The idea of age well is can we put things in place that, that are going to help in these sorts of scenarios, that are going to um, put additional things in place that are going to help people to remain independent, to keep them out of uh, this decline into, uh, often precipitous decline, into um, into dependence. So here's a, some quotes from the Ontario Senior Strategy, but it could be often strategies we read all over the place. Technology is providing new opportunities to deliver care more efficiently and enable increasing numbers of Ontarians or Americans or, uh, or uh, Chinese or Brazilians or whatever to remain more independently at home. Advances in technology have and will continue to serve as enablers in meeting the evolving needs of an aging population. So there's an increasing awareness that we do need to do something and that technology might have a role to play. So, so meet Jim again. Okay, so now it's the, the, the second installment of the story of Jim. Um, is it possible to have a glass of water? Otherwise, my, my, my voice might give up bef between now and uh, No worries. All right, thanks. <clears throat> Actually, did a lot of sports over the weekend, and I think it's affected my, my throat. Uh, so, Jim. Um, so, as I said before, Jim has dementia, but he seems to be thriving quite well in his local community and with the support of his, his sister. Uh, but we 
And he was part of this project where we installed some very, very simple sensor technology in his home, probably the sorts of things that uh, I, I, I saw in the lab t today. Uh, was it in this building? I, I can't remember. Anyway, there's a lab on campus here with simple movement sensors in the, uh, uh, in the, in the ceiling, etc., which is basically just tracking people's movements. Um, what the, the, so this system was installed by uh, our partners from British Telecom, and it, um, it, it basically told us when, you know, Jim's movements in and out of the house, when other people were coming into the house, uh, um, when he went to bed and, and things like that. So just very, very simple uh, sorts of things, which I'm sure you, you've, you, you've probably covered in your courses here. Yeah? Okay. So you're familiar with this sort of technique. It's, it's quite, quite common. However, uh, we, we were looking at Jim's data and we saw some very significant changes in his patterns of, of living. So almost co coincidentally, um, Jim stopped going out of his house. Uh, so, and as I said before, he used to go down to the shops and buy himself some food and things like that. So Jim stopped going out of his house and at the same time, his sister stopped visiting him. Okay. Um, so, we look, this went on for a few days and it seemed to be um, you know, something that had started to occur or, or not occur. So we thought we'd better go and check up on what was happening with, uh, with, with Jim. So we went to, went to Jim's house and when we saw him there, he was in pretty bad state. Okay? So what had happened to him is that his feet had become very, very sore and he wasn't able to, um, to, to walk out the house anymore. He couldn't, uh, it was too painful for him to walk down to the shops. Consequently, he wasn't getting any food in the house. Okay, so when we visited, there was virtually no food in his, uh, in his refrigerator uh, at all. Okay. The reason why his sister wasn't coming to visit him was that her husband, uh, who was uh, an elderly person, become sick. She was having to spend her time looking after her husband. Didn't have time to come and visit, uh, visit Jim on a, on a regular basis. Um, and she was obviously somebody who was very important to Jim being able to uh, li live independently. The problem he had with his feet is that his toenails had grown quite long and it actually started to lacerate and ulcerate his feet. Okay, we, 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 we don't know for sure. I'm guessing or our team guessed that his sister cut his toenails, okay? When she stopped uh, visiting him, it, 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 it sort of rapidly uh, deteriorated. Um, so what happened is that we, we got some simple care for Jim's feet, uh, got those sorted out. We organized some, um, uh, some community support services to come into his home um, an hour or so a day. Um, to make up for the fact that his sister couldn't, couldn't uh, uh, come anymore. So, uh, and like I've lost contact with Jim, I don't know now what, what situation with Jim, but we were able to stabilize Jim to help him to stay living independently at home. So what we have there is a, firstly a very simple and cheap, uh, inexpensive piece of technology in the home that was actually a good example of how that sort of tech mono simple monitoring technology could potentially have a big impact by helping to keep people, uh, somebody uh, in, in their own home and out of the expensive um, uh, options of probably he would have ended up in, um, in, a hosp in the emergency room, you know. Uh, probably within a week I would have expected him to be in an emergency room and probably after that he would have ended up not coming back home, but gone into uh, some sort of uh, residential facility. So by putting this intervention in place, um, we guess we've improved or helped maintain Jim's quality of life and saved a considerable amount of money in the process. So win-win, okay? So that's the scenario that we're trying to have here, a win-win scenario where the, 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 the person themselves um, is, is able to live independently, uh, but equally uh, we're, we're avoiding the expensive uh, options that, 
typically happening. Okay. Any questions so far? Any observations? Oh, yeah. Um, the, I know one reason the aviation industry turned it around is just for profits. I mean, the yeah. safer they are, the more people fly. Is there an analog to that? that? That is a really good question because we're going to come on to that more about the innovation, uh, mm -hmm. about the innovation process. Is in the care industry, I think, there's, or, or, and generally speaking in the healthcare industry, there's little incentive to innovate. And, and I think that's, and there's very little capacity to innovate. So particularly within the, the long-term care sector, within the residential, the nursing home sector, you know, it, the, the best case scenario from their perspective is business as usual, okay? And they have very little incentive from the funding agents agencies to, to change the way that they, they do things. Um, and indeed, you know, it's a big problem, and I was ch chatting about this to people this morning, in the situation of British Columbia. Um, there, over the last 20 or so years, services in the community have probably declined compared to, you, you know, in, uh, sign quite significantly. Uh, and most of the healthcare budget is being consumed by the, uh, by the acute sector. Um, so there's, uh, so they've, they've actually just released a new policy document in British Columbia where they're giving targets to the, to, uh, in terms of health spending to shift that balance back into, uh, in, into community support. Um, because unless there's, unless there's some real push and drive for an incentive for change, and, and if you're going to change something, you're going to have to spend money on it. That's one, that's one of the important things. You either got to save money significantly in an area, or you've got to find new investment, or you, you build a new product, but whatever it is, it's not, it's not an easy process. Ah, thank you very much. So that's a, that's a good point. You know, uh, with the, the aviation industry is very is is different in in, in that respect. But the the main the the the, the, the two main lessons are, are that yes, you can change something if there's enough incentive and enough desire to do to do something. So this is. Um, this is my personal timeline in, ger in gerund technology, okay? So these are uh, uh, a sample of various projects that I've been involved in over the uh, um, uh, last couple of decades. And it started uh, um, very early on as I was in a project, I wasn't exactly in this project, but it, it kind of piqued my interest. Um, it was, to and this is going back to maybe about 1990, uh, there was a, a European research project which was looking at technology in motor cars to help seniors to drive better, more safely, uh, which was pretty interesting, you know, 25 years ago. Um, some of those technologies, for example, GPS navigation, are now widely adopted, um, and those things were in their infancy back, uh, back in, in those times. But the idea of na things like navigation, self-parking, uh, cars, et cetera, et cetera, were uh, kind of coming into the, uh, what was the other one? Um, you know, attention wandering, you know, is, um, I'm sure you psychologists know all about that. Um, so, uh, so having technologies in the car might help people to, to you know, keep driving uh, and keep driving safely. So that was kind of piqued my interest because you know typically we don't associate seniors with with technology okay in, in fact we probably you know generally speaking we think of seniors as being not very technologically oriented okay but it, I saw the value of what this might be able to do um, uh, and uh, I got involved in a European organization called COST A5, which was another European-funded 
uh, thing, which was looking, which was very early stages of the concept of gerund technology. So if you've looked at some of the original um, sort of writings in this area, some of the people uh, involved in cost A5 were, were around uh, at, at that time. And really were quite visionary in the sense that, you know, and, and, and really the mission statement that I, that I uh, started with, that mission statement, can we use technology to innovate, to provide more services, to keep people living independently at home? That existed in 1990. Okay, so you know, it, so there was quite a, a, a visionary thing at, at, at the time. So Cost A5 morphed into this uh, society of German technology. Uh, I was involved in a vari various projects. Um, uh, the one that says Planning and Car Keys, it's, it's not, I, that's a misspelling, it was called Care Keys, not Car Keys. Uh, and uh, these, th those projects were about, um, they were kind of software engineering pro projects around uh, planning services and optimizing quality of life for seniors. Things which were more in the fi field of gerund technology, uh, I was involved in a project called Simbad, which was um, uh, sort of, um, uh, computer vision uh, technology. Uh, it was actually using infrared detectors to create infrared blob maps of people moving and, th and things like that. So there was a particular company that I worked with in, um, in the UK and they were very interested in uh, creating something, uh, s some sort of fall detector based, uh, based around that. Uh, the Community Care and Save project was the sort of thing I was involved in with, uh, with the project that I mentioned uh, with, with Jim. So a lot of the research, you know, going, going early on in, in, in my life was focused around safety and security of people, you know, helping them to stay safe and secure in their homes. But I think the next project was quite interesting. It was called Independent. And the independent project, we changed our kind of vision a little bit and we said why do we always talk about aging purely in terms of problems, okay? Why don't we, instead of, so and if you've done any psychological research, how you ask a question very often determines the sorts of answers you will get, yeah? You'd agree on that one, okay? So. If you ask the question to somebody, well, what are your problems? You're going to get people saying, well, I, you know, I can't remember to take my medication or, you know, I can't sleep at night and I'll get up and, you know, I fall over sometimes if I go to the bed. Yeah. So people, if you ask a person what their problems are, they'll tell you what their problems are. But if you ask a per question, well, what makes your life worth living? What do you like to do? You're going to get a completely different set of answers to that. And that's the question that we asked. We asked people, this was a project about people with dementia, so we asked people themselves and also their family caregivers, what really contributes to you having a good quality of life? What really makes a difference in your life? And we got a different set of ideas about the technologies that we were uh, uh, going to be developing in our, in our project. So we moved away quite significantly from the safety and security agenda to something which was more around uh, everyday life and leisure and enjoyment and, and things. Okay. Um, and aging isn't all bad. There are, you know, all the people seem to have relatively good time, surprisingly. Okay. Uh, and that's what we should be trying, that's, you know, as well as keeping people healthy and safe and secure, we also be, should be thinking about how we can do that. So one of the r projects that emerged out of here and actually became a commercialized product was, uh, was based on our research that we did into uh, uh, music and dementia. Uh, we did a lot of research around people's, what, what people liked and one of the emerging themes out of that was, well, people with dementia like music and often surprisingly their ability to appreciate and respond to music 
is often preserved when other aspects of their cognitive abilities disappear. Okay? So I've known people who are unable to talk who can play the piano. Now, that to me is a pretty amazing kind of uh, situation. Or somebody who's, um, who, 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 who is very uncommunicative will start singing a song. Okay. There has been a, a movie out quite recently, has, any, every, every, has anybody seen it, where they gave uh, people um, um, an iPod uh, in a nursing home for dementia? No? Okay, well, it, it's quite, um, I, I don't have the YouTube link to it. But yeah, if you give, uh, so the movie was about uh, simply that, giving people an iPod, playing music that they liked on, uh, on the iPod. Uh, in, a, in a nursing home, and how that turns somebody from being, uh, you know, just sitting there in a catatonic state into being engaged and, you know, and, and happy looking and, and things like that. So, uh, so, so that's quite inspirational, okay? So we developed a, um, a very, very simple music playing device because what we found is that there's a whole set of barriers to why people couldn't remember, couldn't play music or access music on their own. Firstly, they may not remember that they like music, okay? And even if they remember that they like music, they might not remember what sort of music that they like, okay? Or what songs they like. Or, and then, even if they remembered all that, they may no longer have, remember how to operate the music playing equipment, okay? So we developed a very, very simple music playing device. And unfortunately, I haven't got it with me. Um, I, I, I could have brought one. Um, we, well, we developed a prototype, which was, very, which was basically an MP3 player in something that looked like a, a music box. You lifted the lid, it played music. The, it, the music was pre-programmed in, didn't have any controls for, for the volume, etc. cetera. Um, uh, you, 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 somebody had to put the music in, I agree but it allowed a person to simply lift the lid and it played music. Now, the, the, the actual commercializable product looks like an old style radio that people um, um, uh, might have had years and years ago, uh, but it still works on the same principles. Very, very, <laughs> virtually no controls at all. You lift the lid, it plays. You sh shut the lid, it, uh, it switches off. And that's proved quite, quite successful and um, is a commercializable or commercialized product. And to be honest, most of the projects that I've been involved in since then has had that kind of focus. So Soprano was a, a big EU project which was around smart home technologies. But again, what we, what we did in that, in that project was to ask again, you know, what are the important things about you and your life and how you live your life at home. And, that, uh, and we went around and asked people uh, about this. And it, this raised things like, well, social participation, the, be, the ability for a person to contribute to their community is still an important thing. And we kind of forget about that. We all, often think about seniors as being dependent and you know, excluded and isolated. But many people want to contribute, and they feel they they they, um, they, they get a big buzz about, about feeling they're able to give something back to the community uh, that 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 they live in. So can we can we use technology to um, uh, to do that? And that's that's kind of emerging in the AgeWell project that I'm now involved in, which is. Uh, and we have a project in there on digital storytelling, which is about helping people to tell their stories and uh, to, the, to the wider community. And, what, and how, can we, uh, how, how, how can people uh, use their experience to uh, uh, communicate to uh, the rest of the world? Okay. So I've got about 15 minutes. So one of the interesting things right now is that I think it's possible to identify a number of trends which are now coming together, which really may indicate that 
there's going to be significant traction within this sector in uh, right now or the very near future. One of the one of the problems in this sector, and this is what I, the, the, the big message that I want to get over in the, the final part of my talk today, is that despite all the great research that we've been doing, despite the many courses that have started to emerge in, in the area of gerund technology, of which this is one, um, relatively little is getting into the real world. Okay, so that's not just happening here in the States or in Canada, but even in Europe. Now in Europe, they've been investing in this area, going back to the project that I did on, on driving, they've been investi investing European um, uh, taxpayers' money in the area of um, technology and aging. Pretty much, I think the first program, research program was the 1992, okay? So they've been investing massive amounts of money in, uh, in this area since, uh, <coughs> since the early 90s. Um, they now have something called the Ambient Assisted Living Joint Program. Are people aware of that at all? Yeah? So the Ambient Assisted Living Joint Program is in its second period of five years. In the first year, it had over a billion euros of investment. So that's a very significant amount of money in this area. Uh, I think the current five-year budget is 800 million euros or something like that. That is in addition to all the money that is going into the, the program which is called Horizon 2020 right now, which also has a significant program in the area of ambient technology, smart homes, um, you know, digital media and, and all that with a significant uh, um, uh, um, alignment with, uh, with healthcare research. So despite all the investment that's going in into this area, very little has, has emerged in terms of real products and services. And that is the challenge that we have. In many ways, and I'm not, I, I don't want to underestimate the, the kind of engineering and computing science um, challenges that exist. But in many ways, what we should be doing is, is using what we've already done what the technologies that already exist and to try and get those into creating novel real world products uh, and, and services. And I think that's the, that's the, big, the big deal and big challenge that we've got in the, uh, in the future. Especially as we all know, there's increasing numbers of seniors within the, old, older, uh, within the population. So there's, there's gonna be increasing demands for innovative solutions. We're also seeing seniors becoming more tech savvy. Yeah? Would you agree? Yeah? So typically seniors are later adopters, but increasingly we're seeing all, uh, seniors as, uh, and some seniors, um, and I mentioned this earlier on, uh, younger male seniors are very high users of the, of the internet. A lot of people have smartphones now. Yeah. So there is no... The, just because you're old doesn't mean you're, gonna, you're, you're not going to use technology. I think that's the thing we've got to uh, look at. And indeed, if we think of, you know, going back to the market thing that you mentioned before, is that it's really, if, if we're looking at markets and consumptions in, in demographic terms, it's the seniors uh, market that is the growing market in the, um, in the future. How in how how uh, businesses will respond to that is difficult to tell, but in terms of who's going to be buying things, where the money is, it's, that is the, the growing sector. We can also see that um, the area of pervasive computing, uh, ambient computing, and the Internet of Things is now actually becoming a reality. <clears throat> right. You can go down the Apple store and buy things now which would have cost for a few dollars which would have literally cost you thousands of dollars um, a few years ago so my colleague Alex Miletis who people here know quite well spent a, a huge amount of research funding on developing a, um, uh, a, a sensor only um, to find that the Microsoft Connect uh, was, <laughs> was launched and basically did away with all this research because it was a it was a better tool, it was more robust, 
uh, and it was cheap, right? Um, so yeah, he, d he did all that research and then uh, something else came along. Uh, so yeah, these things are now be definitely becoming more of a, a, of a possibility. Yeah. Uh, and healthcare technologies are the next best thing with significant global investment in, in this area. Uh, so quite a lot of the technology shows now in, in, in recent years have seen a vast proliferation of uh, healthcare technologies and applications. So the mission of AgeWell is to help Canadian seniors to remain in their own homes and communities and support their families uh, and caregivers. So this is going back to the original uh, mission that I have. These are some snapshots of what age well so in in the Canadian sphere this is a big deal right um, so a, a, a network of centers of excellence is a big investment by the Canadian uh, federal government so we have a five-year program of research with 37 million dollars uh, we have 27 um, universities across Canada um, uh, wor working with us over a hundred what we call HQPs, highly qualified personnel, that's master students, um, PhDs, postdocs uh, within our program. That's actually probably an underestimate. I think probably now already, and AgeWell's only been going for six months, we've got probably 120 um, HQPs in our program. Uh, 79 community partners and we've just funded 25 initial research projects uh, around technology and aging and we also have what we call cross-cutting activities which are focused on those areas that are particularly important about real-world impact in areas of knowledge mobilization commercialization uh, what we call transdisciplinary working which is about how do people from the different disciplines and, and sectors that we're working in. How do, how do we work effectively together? And then fourthly, a lot of emphasis on training of, uh, of people, uh, of students and uh, etc. Et within our program. Because really, to, to my mind, it's the training element that will have the biggest payback here. Okay? Because it's people such as yourself who been exposed to these sorts of new innovatory ways of thinking about how we can uh, help support seniors that are going on to really have an effect in the real world through the jobs that you're, you're probably going to have. And I actually say this to the public, one of the, one of the uh, depressing statistics for postdocs, okay, is that 90% of postdoctoral researchers don't go on to an academic career. Okay, so most people who who go on to advance, you know, re levels of research within a university, don't actually go on to academic careers. So they go on to other things. Okay, so really, our training and our education has to take that seriously. And what can we, um, what can we do? Because People with that sort of background and experience are going to be ambassadors. They're the people who are actually going to be building capacity within the within the industry and within service providers. That is going to make the difference. Okay. So again, going back to the long-term care uh, ex uh, situation about innovation in the long-term care sector, in nursing homes and things like that, they have very little capacity. To, uh, to, to innovate because there is no history of innovation. There's no experience about what innovation is about, okay? So I'm working with a, um, a, a, a company now who've just appointed a director of innovation who has no experience in innovation because they don't, <laughs> they don't have anybody from that background within their, within their organization. And she's, you know, so um, that's a big challenge. And we, I've worked with a number of companies who wanted to do new things, but finding the right people with the right mindsets, with the drive and determination, and the skills and the experience to, to innovate within an organization is, is a real challenge, okay? So that, that would be, so the training element, giving people the skills and the expertise and the, 
uh, and the uh, determination to do this is a, is a major objective of what we're trying to do. So these are our aims. Typically, uh, what you'll see in most uh, uh, research programs, uh, um, you know, carry out research. We particularly want to break down the silos that seem to exist. You know, we often call ourselves psychologists or computer scientists or sociologists or engineers. Really, where creation happens is where everybody gets together and really starts to communicate to each other and to develop solutions um, together. Now, again, going back to many of the research projects that I was involved in early on, especially a lot of the European projects, people did bits of research, you know. So I would do some user needs analysis and then I'd write a report and that would go to, you know, uh, somebody who specs out the requirements and then that would go to a software engineer, et cetera, et cetera. By the time it came back to me as somebody who's going to evaluate the, the, um, the, the system that had been developed, it didn't look like anything like I'd originally uh, thought about it. Uh, there's a cartoon that I know software developers always show about this process mm -hmm. and where it all goes wrong. It's like a game of whispers. Okay. It's when you have real meaningful interaction between the people who are going to innovate in this sector, the people who are coming up with the ideas, with the technologies, but also the end users themselves, the service providers, the, and the companies, the commercial companies that are going to take these technologies and turn them into real products. Okay? Everybody really needs to be together at some point to understand each other's perspective. Otherwise, it's not, it's not going to work. And the, and the, the really successful um, uh, models of innovation really emphasize those, uh, those sorts of interactions. So I, I'm actually not going to speak very much about what the technologies that we're, uh, the, or the technology program that we're doing within, within AgeWell. Uh, so information about this you can find on, online. So if you Google AgeWell Canada, you'll find everything there. We've got numbers of projects which are around understanding the, the needs of, of users, but not typical kind of academic research into needs, but more about how do we better involve end users and seniors in the, in the research, that, that in the technology development, so that seniors are part of the technology development process from start to finish and having an input in there. How can we involve them? What's the best way of involving them? We have a number of projects in a wide range of, uh, of technological areas. For example, robotics and smart home technologies. Um, uh, and we've talked uh, already uh, a bit about people with dementia. Uh, we also technologies to assist people with physical impairments and disabilities. So, for example, we have a project on, um, on smart wheelchairs. Okay, so smart wheelchairs which can help people with dementia. And already we've started to look at the commercialization aspects of, of that. One of the big, the, the bit, one of the big um, aspects of what we're doing in AgeWell is that we're asking all our researchers to come up with an implementation plan, with a commercialization plan right at the start. Okay? So, you know, typically knowledge translation and commercialization is done right at the end. So you do your research and maybe you've come up with a great idea, a great prototype, and now you say, well, now I'm going to take it out to, uh, uh, and commercialize it. By then, it may be too late because you may already have built things in which are not going to work in the, in the real world. Okay? There may have been decisions very early on that if you'd had this commercial perspective would have changed the decision making in the, um, in the, in the technology development. So having that, even if it's, even it's just bringing in some expertise and some, um, uh, uh, some consultation about this or working with um, people in the commercial sector 
uh, will, will really be very helpful. And where's that technology going to be implemented? Really understanding the context of use in which it's going to happen. Uh, technologies to enable greater social interaction, um, etc., cetera, et cetera. So those are all online. Where we're doing a lot of research and where I think and I'm going to come to an, an end here without coming to the, <laughs> the, the, the final slides, is that really we need to pay more attention to the area of innovation. What is innovation? What does it, what does it mean? How can we best facilitate it? So in areas such as policy, reimburse, reimbursement and the regulatory landscape um, in Canada and, and, and elsewhere. For example, in, um, in British Columbia, it's very difficult if you're a senior to get funding from the healthcare program for what might be described as, as health technologies. If you're younger than 65, you're more like, a lot more likely to get it. So the reimbursement system is actually working against the adoption of preventative technologies here. So they've got to think a bit more creatively about that. We need to think about things like the ethical privacy and security factors that are most likely to contribute to the, some of the di disparities in the usage of, a, a, of emerging technologies. And increasingly, we need to probably do what might be called meta-research, which is about understanding the innovation process and really using that understanding to uh, drive the research programs that, um, that, uh, that, that we're doing. Um, so rather than having this technology push model, which has often been the, uh, the scenario uh, in the past, to have uh, a model which is about engaged innovation, uh, experiential uh, design, um, and, and commercialization and implementation built in from the start. So I'm going to draw it to a close there. The paper that I sent out kind of identifies some of the challenges and potential solutions to some of these issues around innovation uh, that, that I've kind of highlighted. And I think, what, uh, and I'm very convinced that one of the big deals in here is that, and I'm speaking as a gerontologist here, is that we've got to rethink some of the ways that we train and teach people in the field of aging research. Um, so increasingly, um, you know, the group here, you know, we've got engineers and computer scientists here are getting interested in the aging population. Uh, I don't see a lot of computer, computer scientists and engineers at SFU taking our gerontology courses. Yeah? They're not interested. They're more, they're, they, but I think that's because our gerontology courses are not right. We need to change our gerontology training to give the right sort of information, the right sort of ideas to the target audience so that it helps them to understand the, the problem space uh, better in a way that's more accessible to, to them. Okay, so I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Okay. What sort of robotics are you talking about? Um, I mean, yeah, so, yeah, because you know, because there's um, there's different concepts of what that might look like. So something that is like an on-screen avatar that can give um, you know information and communicate with somebody in an intuitive way. Um, I, d I did some research around that a few years ago as part of the Soprano project. I was actually surprised just how well people responded to that and how much they liked it and liked that sort of um, interaction. Whether something like a full-blown care assistant robot will ever emerge is, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether that's going to happen in the, in, in the, very, in the very near future. Um, you know, so that, and there are certain technical technological challenges around that. And also maybe some of the thinking around it is not quite right. You know, I've spoken to some of the engineers at SFU and they, they want to design robots that will, you know, 
get clothes out of a drawer and help people to dress and things like that. I think that is a very, very significant technical challenge, whereas other things might be relatively more straightforward. And also what might be called companion robots, which are providing you know, just general interaction, might be something that, uh, that is more, uh, um, more amenable as well.